I want to welcome everybody this morning. My name is Pete Abear. I'm executive director of Mass Econ, and we appreciate you all coming out uh, this morning for this event. I um, want to acknowledge and thank our sponsors and certainly acknowledge our host as well, MassBio. We're very glad. Ben Bradford from uh, MassBio is here. It's a great space. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to use it. And also acknowledge and thank our, our sponsors, so Sanofi, Bowditch, and uh, VHB. We're very thankful for their support. One word on Sanofi. Uh, so there are a couple of representatives from Sanofi in the audience today, and you may look at their name cards and it says Sanofi Genzyme. And I know while we all honor the, the memory of Genzyme as a wonderful organization, um, Sanofi Genzyme actually doesn't exist, but somehow these name tags came out with Sanofi Genzyme on them. From, uh, uh, but in any case, we're very pleased that Sanofi, and I've worked uh, for some time with George, and, and we're so appreciative to have Ra Raquel with us uh, today as well. So Sanofi Bowditch and, and uh, um, uh, VHB, thank you so much for your support. Uh, a little explanation about the spotlight series. This is our fifth spotlight. Greater Boston actually is the last uh, spotlight in the first round of, of these events that we've done. We've held events throughout the state and during the pandemic virtually where we focus on a different region of the state. Massachusetts is a small state, but it has uh, def defined uh, uh, regions uh, they have something of their own econo uh, economic characteristics. And when we as an organization, as, as Mass Econ, promoting Massachusetts as a destination for businesses, we want to learn more about each region and how each region would in fact characterize itself and, and talk about itself uh, to uh, prospects that are considering Massachusetts as a place to locate to or, or grow in. And so it's been a wonderful discussion that we, we started actually back in February of 2020 in the southeast region. We moved to west, north, northeast, central, uh, and today we conclude this first round uh, in Greater Boston. Uh, so it's been a great experience for us. And again, what we do really from these events is extract what we can in terms of how do we talk about the greater Boston region to the world. Um, Boston is a, is a brand unto itself. It's an important brand. People, when they refer to Boston, they're referring really to you know, Eastern Massachusetts, Massachusetts, New England even. Uh, when you talk to a foreign delegation at, a, at an event, they, they use Boston, and we use Boston, and it's fine. So it's a great brand to have, uh, but we want to be able, as an organization, really to talk about a, a greater Boston in a way that's, that's effective and, and, and actually conveys to our audience uh, of prospects that are considering Massachusetts uh, some nuance about greater Boston that perhaps we're not sharing at this point. So we want to put the best foot forward uh, for uh, the greater Boston region. So that's, the, that's the, the story behind these spotlights, and we'll continue these in, in the years ahead as well. A little bit about Mass Econ. For those of you who don't know us, we are a 501c6 membership organization and a 501c3 education foundation. We are uh, focused on helping uh, and, and being a partner with state government in growing economic opportunity here in Massachusetts. And we are focused on the entire state. So we are a nonprofit. Uh, we are uh, supported by the private industry at, to be a partner with state government. And we have representatives from state government here today, and, uh, including MOBD and uh, Mass Office of Business Development. Those relationships are critical to us, but we can fill a role that state government uh, it needs assistance with. We do a lot of site location services, especially, and we are the prov provider of those services on, uh, to the state and on behalf of the state. Uh, we sit on a mountain of economic information that we, we bring into play, but our focus is uh, statewide, and we're a unique in, in, uh, organization uh, in, in that way. So uh, that's a little bit about Mass Econ and our mission. Uh, we're going to have a great panel today. We're very happy to have Paul Bauer uh, as our moderator, and we have we have some wonderful uh, panelists from different perspectives. So we have different industries that are 
that are leading industries in the greater Boston region represented. And we also have real estate uh, perspective, staffing perspective, and economic developer perspective as well from the city of, uh, city of Boston. So we're very appreciative to have uh, all of our panelists join us just a little bit later in this discussion. And we capture this, and we'll actually be doing some interviews with the panelists later, again, to capture the, uh, the, the, the essence of uh, this region from an economic development perspective. So on our website, as we go about the business of promoting Massachusetts, we have a Why Massachusetts page. And so when we're uh, focusing on site selectors around the world, around the country, and we want to talk about Massachusetts, we often refer them to our, our website, of course, and we, we send them to the Why Massachusetts and we, uh, page. And that's where we're making the case for Massachusetts. Uh, and we have that split up uh, according to regions as well. So we have Greater Boston. And this is sort of the header that we have uh, on the Greater Boston region sort of explain it. This is what we use right now. And beneath this is a mountain of information, a lot of information about the, the greater Boston region, why it makes sense for, uh, for organizations. And so really, again, what we're trying to do today is, is add additional flavor to what we're saying in our Why Massachusetts pages. And if you haven't visited our website, uh, at massecon.com. Uh, go, please go to the, the White Massachusetts page and check out what we're doing because that's that's how we put the the the, the you know, that what we hope is the front door to uh, Massachusetts through those pages for companies that are considering uh, a location in the area. But let's uh, let's start off with with a few challenges. I'm going to share a lot of slides of a lot of good news, a lot of interesting characteristics about. The, the region before we head into the panel discussion. But there are challenges out there. Uh, uh, economic inequity, uh, a real issue. We, Massachusetts is as the sixth uh, biggest wealth gap by uh, race in the United States. Uh, it's a real issue uh, that we have and we have to solve. Uh, high cost of living, certainly right up there as we deal with with uh, organizations that are considering Massachusetts, cost, uh, cost of living, cost of doing business uh, is, is often an issue. And cost of living index, Boston region versus US 32% higher than the US in general. Median selling price of homes up to at the last, uh, last count, $845,000. It's an 11% increase over last year. So there are issues, there are cost issues certainly. Uh, and you know, big macro issues that Massachusetts has to work uh, to solve. Um, so we acknowledge those, and the, the, there, are, there are more in addition to this. But sometimes we look at issues uh, as troubling, as uh, you know, of concern, without perhaps sometimes recognizing that there are assets uh, and, and uh, important qualities to uh, some of these uh, some of these issues that are important to note. So we're going to touch on some of those in, in a, just a few seconds. So l stepping back, looking at the Massachusetts uh, in terms of uh, the growth of real product in the most uh, recent period, we've outperformed the the nation in the last uh, last uh, four quarters. So that is promising uh, for Massachusetts. We while we certainly uh, experienced a a uh, a downturn, as did the rest of the country, and, and the downturn was a little bit uh, more keenly felt here in Massachusetts than some other parts of the country. We've also come out of it uh, in, in a strong fashion. Uh, in terms of earnings and payroll, we've seen the, the uh, payroll employment increase in the last quarter, 5.2%. That exceeds the national uh, number. Wage and salary has increased rather dramatically. Uh, also in the last quarter, 12.6% uh, versus a, a national 8.1%. So uh, robust uh, numbers. However, that's accompanied by inflation. And so, and we have felt that more keenly here in the Boston metro area, 10.8% in the uh, last available quarter that we have information for. And that's uh, uh, above the, slightly above the national number. So, uh, 
we, we acknowledge those things. So on to things that we, we also concern ourselves with. I, I, this is not the list that you would expect when we talk about longest commutes in the United States. These are somewhat obscure uh, cities and towns around uh, the United States, but they have the longest uh, commute times in the country. A uh, 47 minute one way commute in Temesco Valley, California. So, all things are relative. Uh, so, we don't compare the greater Boston region to these regions, but there are folks in, in the country, all around the country, that are, that are struggling with long commutes for a variety of reasons. Um, but when we look at the greater Boston region versus Comparable, uh, comparable regions. We see, I, I think we would all say here in, in Boston, we struggle with commuting times, and some of you may have even struggled today. You're not alone. Uh, so uh, try New York, try Washington, try San Francisco. They have longer mean travel times, one-way travel times than we do in Boston. Though I do have to admit, when I see 30.8 minutes uh, one way, and uh, getting into Boston, I, that, that sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> but, but the numbers don't lie. They can't, this is after all the US Census Bureau, so it has to be right. Uh, but they, we're also talking about a, re, uh, a region here and not you know, downtown Boston necessarily. Uh, but, but regardless, uh, comparable regions, yes. Uh, getting in and out of, of Boston, Cambridge can be troubling, but we're not alone there, and in fact, we're in better shape than, than some other, uh, other comparable uh, metropolitan areas. We have the third largest light rail transit system in the country as measured by daily uh, ridership, and this is from February of 2020, so we, we don't have the numbers since, and, but it also doesn't make sense to, to use the numbers during the pandemic uh, either. So we went back to uh, the 2020 numbers, and we see you know, we, have, we have this important asset, an important asset that has troubles, that has issues, and we even saw some this week with our brand new uh, heavy rail uh, uh, trains, some of them coming offline for, for different issues. Uh, but we have this incredible light rail transit system. So think, light, think green line for light rail. And then when we look at the heavy rail transit system, think red line and, and others on that, um, we are the fourth largest system in the country. And there are only 14 heavy rail systems in the country. And so when we think of a lot of our competition out there, certainly the, the company, the, the, the cities that may pop up these days as you know, new competitors uh, in addition to the, our old competitors for business opportunities. Uh, we have to remember they, a lot of these new competitors have no uh, real substantial uh, light or heavy rail uh, transportation systems. And, and we have this incredible asset. As troubled as it may be, it exists, and so it's an important, uh, it's an important asset to, to note. Um, we have the Port of Boston. Now, Port of Boston, in terms of rank, in terms of uh, TEUs, which is 20-ton uh, 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 container units, uh, cargo units, uh, as a measure used in the industry, 19th. 19th doesn't seem terribly high, but we are the most significant, Boston is the most significant port in New England uh, by, by far, and, service, and services this region uh, extremely well, and it is now big ship ready. And so that's an important investment that has been made, $850 million to modernize the Conley term, Terminal, to do, uh, to do work in terms of deepening the harbor, uh, adding uh, more capacity in terms of cranes and so forth. And so big ship ready means, for example, uh, the Ever Fortune arrived, uh, it, its, its capacity is about 140,000 TEUs, cargo units. And to put that into perspective, in 2019, Boston, its entire uh, 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 cargoes that came in were 162. So just one of these ships coming you know, adds a great deal of, of capacity now to uh, the port of Boston. So another important asset, our international airport, and every, nobody likes to travel uh, by air these days, and I understand that. Uh, but in terms of 
uh, ranking as an international airport in, in the U.S., uh, Boston comes in at 10 in terms of uh, uh, foreign destinations and airlines serving those destinations. Uh, in terms of passengers, we're in the top 15. So we have an important hub in terms of international travel here in Boston that is worthy to know. And I, I will admit I haven't traveled that much by air in the last two years, but the couple times I've been through uh, Logan recently have not been... You know, we, it, Logan gets the bad rap perhaps sometimes when you have cancellations and cancellations are due to any number of things uh, based on the, whether airlines, tr uh, weather, all of that sort of thing. Uh, but some significant investments have been made in Logan in uh, the, uh, the last few years, which are notable. And so this is, again, another asset uh, for the region. I uh, want to look at population change in the decade from 2010 to uh, 2020. Um, you will note that Massachusetts is the in a uh, deeper shade of blue on the screen. We had 7.4% uh, growth in Massachusetts in that period, and that was exactly the number nationwide. So the nation grew by 7.4%, so did Massachusetts. And we are something of an outlier in the Northeast in terms of population growth. We're the only state in New England that, that grew uh, at, at the same rate as the U.S. in that uh, period of time. And other than New Jersey, we stand out in the Northeast Midwest region uh, in terms of the amount of population we have added. Uh, and that stands in contrast, again, to, to the rest of the region. So doing something right in terms of attracting people. And Suffolk County here in uh, the Greater Boston Region and Middlesex County are, are examples of where a lot of that growth took place, 11% uh, growth in Suffolk County as an example. And we know during the pandemic there was uh, that, that growth receded and actually went the other way, but we also have noted that that uh, population is, uh, is coming back as well. So uh, important numbers there for Massachusetts. GDP, consistent high performance in Massachusetts in terms of gross domestic product. In 2019, before the pandemic, we had the highest per capita GDP uh, in the country, and we're consistently one or two in that category from one year to the next. Uh, and in, our, in 2021, the real GDP in Massachusetts exceeded the national growth uh, in, in, uh, in, that, in uh, that recovery year. And thinking of Greater Boston as a big economic engine, which it is, when we think about uh, uh, GDP, 62% of it is generated in the Greater Boston area. So it is an economic uh, power, certainly in, in New England, and represents a great deal of the growth in, in Massachusetts. Suffolk County alone has a GDP that's larger than 13 states. Pretty pretty impressive. And if you combine it with Middlesex County, Suffolk and Middlesex have GDP that exceeds 29 states. So just these, uh, these two counties, as an example, uh, of the, the greater Boston area uh, convey you know, the size and the strength of the economy here in the greater Boston region. I don't want to shift to the stuff that I love talking about. I could talk about it all day, um, and uh, people on my, my team probably the eyes roll. But we're talking about uh, a fun thing that we call location quotients and industry concentration. Uh, and what that means in economic development, these are important numbers uh, to understand. Uh, we're looking at, a, at employment in, a, uh, in an industry in a region versus employment that you would expect in that region, given the uh, national, uh, national averages. So for example, in Suffolk County, portfolio management, in which we have 16,000 employees in Suffolk County alone, the location quotient is 15. So a location quotient of one means you're about where you would expect in terms of employment of that industry in that region that you're looking at, compared to the nation as a whole. We have 15 times the employment in that industry in 
uh, Suffolk alone. And you go down the list, and this is just a, a sampling of those in which we, uh, industries in which we have a heavy concentration. It's research and development and biotech nine times uh, the concentration of uh, number of, of workers that you would expect. So uh, nine times the national average, five times for investment advice, securities, uh, again, five times, and you go right down the list. Software publishing, three times. Uh, lawyers, three times. <laughs> I, I threw that out there to you, Paul. Um, commercial banking, almost two times. So, uh, it, you know, in, impressive numbers for industries that you want in, in your industry. These are all high performing, uh, uh, high uh, revenue industries and that, that support uh, high paying jobs. Uh, look at Middlesex, and we see analytical lab manufacturing 21 times. Uh, the employment that you, you would expect. So, you know, again, a very, and these numbers speak to str the strength of these regions. If they're here, they're here because the people are here uh, to support what they're doing, and that's where we'd expect other, uh, other types of companies in those, re uh, in those industries to be interested in Massachusetts. So we use these numbers a lot to, to convey to those outside of Massachusetts you should be here because look at, look at the strength of the industry in this region. And so you go right down the list, whether it's, whether it's uh, electrical uh, signal testing or electromedical apparatus or nanotechnology, measuring and control device manufacturing, all very impressive numbers. Uh, and, and again, frankly, industries you want in, in your region, and they're all well represented here in Greater Boston. Um, just uh, looking at some other statistics before we, I, I pass the, the microphone to Paul. Uh, 25, uh, we're uh, in terms of the top 25 research uh, life science talent clusters. This is a recent report that just came out last week, so I had to use it. Uh, Boston and Cambridge ex is exemplary in almost every data point. And in terms of the index used in this report, uh, 138 uh, appreciably higher than the next closest cluster. So again, you know, we talk about it all the time. I think there's a, a, a strong awareness of the strength of the life sciences uh, here in, uh, in the greater Boston and Massachusetts in general, and this speaks to that exactly. Uh, other key rankings, number two in NSF funding, uh, number three in NIH funding, but we have by far, in terms of per capita dollars uh, per person, far uh, number one in both of those categories, both NSF and NIH funding coming to Massachusetts. Number three in venture capital, number one in uh, life science, in biotechnology uh, venture capital, number eight in uh, defense spending. And you can see some of the numbers coming into uh, the Massachusetts economy. And Massachusetts in general, these are things that we feature on our website and the marketing that we do. Best educated workforce, number one in the science and te technology index, most innovative state economy, best performing public schools by any measure. And you sometimes see other states sort of cherry picking, well, we're, we have the best fourth grade mathematics test scores. And so we have the best schools in the country. Well, if you, you take everything together, we have the best performing uh, public schools in, uh, in the US. Uh, venture capital for life sciences, as noted, most energy efficient state, healthiest state. Congratulations, everybody. Please give yourself uh, a hand. You're the healthiest people in, in the country. Congratulations. And uh, worker productivity number two. So uh, you know, all good numbers, and so much of this is generated right here in, in, in Greater Boston, the economic engine to this entire region, uh, as, uh, as noted. So laying the groundwork for the conversation we're about to have, and we want to learn more about this region, those are all good things to talk about, uh, I, I think, in what I presented, but there's much more we're going to learn from, uh, from our panelists right here today. So with that... Let me call forward uh, uh, Paul Bauer, a uh, partner at uh, Bowditch, as our moderator, and actually ask all of the other uh, panelists to join us as well on stage. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I found that to be very interesting, and I think it really helps us to, to get a perspective on the, um, where we are and, and um, our strengths and some of our challenges, too, as a region. Um, I'm Paul Bauer. I'm a partner at Bowditch & Dewey, uh, a law firm I practice in the real estate 
uh, transaction area. I'm the practice area leader for real estate and business groups <clears throat> at the firm. And we're pleased to, um, to be a sponsor and to moderate the panel today. Um, and I will say that um, I started my career. It's always good to get back here to Kendall Square. I started my career um, at USDOT at the Holpe Center um, a long, 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 long time ago. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to say when, although we can probably figure that out, but the Marriott was brand new. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think that uh, Legal Seafood had just moved in uh, to a brand new building there. So it was a long time ago. Um, it has changed slightly um, since then. So anyway, what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to ask uh, our panels to um, introduce themselves, tell a little bit about their uh, their company, their role, what they do. Um, and I think we're just going to go down uh, here. There are mics. There are two mics that can be kind of passed along as we, as we go. We'll see. <laughs> Tucker, you're up. Testing. There we go. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Tucker White, Avison Young. I'm the Northeast uh, Regional Lead for Insight and Innovation Group at AY. Um, that's a rebrand from traditional commercial real estate research. So I, I track uh, supply and demand uh, across the Northeast, and uh, especially as it relates to life sciences for different markets, um, main one being Boston. Uh, Mavis & Young, it's a Canadian-based commercial real estate firm, uh, specialized, specialized in project management, research, and advisory and appraisal. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Raquel Mura. I'm head of R&D in North America as part of our global R&D operations group at Sanofi. Sanofi is one of the world's largest um, biopharma companies. Uh, we develop potentially life-saving medicines. Uh, we develop research and market life-saving medicines as well as vaccines for millions of people. Uh, we have uh, recently opened uh, our Cambridge Crossing location here uh, in Cambridge, hosting 2,500 colleagues across 10 different sites. Uh, my role and the role of my team is to ensure that we have uh, an environment that is uh, cohesive to uh, an excellent and purposeful experience for our scientists in North America and of course here in the area as well as ensure that we have the process and systems in place so that we can enhance the delivery of our pipeline. Thank you. Good morning everyone. My name is Sabrina Antoine Kuhea. I am the Vice President of Community Management at J.P. Morgan Chase. My role is specifically designed to address the racial wealth gap from a hyper-local level here in Boston. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking a little bit more about that and to go in depth, um, but I'm excited to be here today. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Kyle Arache. I'm from General Dynamics Mission Systems. Uh, we are a defense uh, company, global company uh, in Massachusetts area. We have about 3,000 employees. Uh, my team is, is located in Quincy, Mass, and uh, we, we make uh, unmanned underwater vehicles for defense and also for uh, exploration science. Uh, so look forward to talking more also. Good morning. Uh, Don Baldini. I'm a government affairs director for the Northeast for Liberty Mutual Insurance Company. We uh, started in Boston uh, about 110 years ago, created actually by an act of the Massachusetts legislature to create, to uh, write the newly um, mandated coverage of workers' compensation. So we've grown from those, um, those beginnings to be a global diversified property and casualty insurer. We're now the sixth largest global property and casualty insurer, fourth largest in the United States. So for us, it's not a question of, you know, why did you come to Boston? We were born in Boston. We've been here for 110 years. And Obviously, being here has been a, uh, an asset to our, our growth and our continued future growth. So look forward to discussing all that further. Good morning, everyone. My name is Midori Morikawa. I am the Deputy Chief for the Economic Opportunity Inclusion Cabinet under Mayor Wu. Uh, I've been at the city government for about eight years now. I'd like to see I survive under three mayors, Mayor Walsh, <laughs> Mayor Janey, and now Mayor Wu. Um, I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm not from this country. You know, I came here, uh, I was born in Japan. I grew up in Indonesia, Malaysia. Um, and I came here for college and grad school, and, you know, I now call Boston home. So this topic is, uh, you know, very personal to me, uh, where I was able to build my professional network and really um, uh, have a career uh, in the city. So excited to be here. Good morning. 
I'm Laurie Flynn, and I'm with Beacon Hill Staffing Group. I happen to be in particular in the legal division, but we have eight specialty divisions. We have legal, Beacon Hill Legal, Beacon Hill Financial, Beacon Hill Tech, Beacon Hill Pharma, Beacon Hill HR. So we basically cover the, the market in any kind of staffing. Beacon Hill, fa- Beacon Hill Staffing Group was founded in 2000. I've been with them for 19 years, so right from the get-go. And as you can imagine, with the name of Beacon Hill, Boston is near and dear to us. We now have over 50-plus offices across the country. And in this past, in 2021, we, on an average week, were filling more than 7,000 contract and temporary jobs across the country. And in 2021, filled more than 5,000 professional jobs. So we've been very busy. It's a tight market, as we all know, but it's been keeping us very busy, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. What a <clears throat> what a great panel. Um, just a, a lot of diversity of uh, uh, perspectives. I think what we're going to do is we're going to start with sort of uh, the economic development side, then we'll go over to the industry side. Um, uh, we'd, we'd love to get uh, each of, of your um, insights on um, what you see as the advantages of um, the greater Boston area. Um, positive trends you may be seeing, um, your take on sort of where we are and 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 what we've got as tools to move forward. Um, I think we're going to start, Laurie, with you, and then we're going to, so you've got the mic, which is great, and then we're going to um, dial back to um, a, a little bigger perspective. I know that um, a, as a lawyer, it's very difficult right now to get okay. folks, so it's a tough market, um, but maybe you can talk about sort of what you're seeing, how you, um, how you're, what, what the advantages are of the region when you're selling the region, and um, and your take on on it all. Well, as I mentioned, Boston is um, highly competitive right now, but and that's not unique to Boston, as we all know. That's across the country. But I think that really the good news is that the employers in Boston are really adapting, and we are seeing some real innovation from the employers, of what they're doing for their employees, how they're trying to attract folks. The number one currency right now is remote and hybrid options. So not surprisingly, but that is the first question we're getting asked from candidates when we talk to them is, what do you have that's available for remote or hybrid? I think ultimately at the end of the day, the hybrid schedule is the most popular where people, I think, are feeling a little bit more isolated, being 100% remote, unless for obvious reasons that that's a real need to be 100% remote. I think people are finding that after two plus years, perhaps working 100% remote, some of that isolation, some of missing the mentoring, some of those things are are missing. So that's, that's number one. Number two, I think I would say one of the questions that we're getting asked from all candidates, which I think is, is really critically important, is people want to know what companies are doing with their DEI initiatives, so their diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are they doing? What are they saying? And these are real questions. People are asking this in the interviews. People want to know not just what do you say about it on your website, but what are you really doing? What can you show me in an interview panel? Can you show me a diverse interview panel? What are you actually doing out there in DEI? So I think those are, are two things that Boston is really stepping up and, and, and really, I think, being very successful. Uh, the other part is uh, Boston of itself offers so much. You know, we all know that between just th- the location where we are, the schools that we have, we see a lot of trailing spouses. One person's coming here for either an education opportunity or a business opportunity. There are so many diverse industries here. Their spouse can find equally uh, appealing job. So I think those are some of the reasons that, that we're, we're seeing. And of course, competitive salaries. Um, you know, that's something that I've gone, you know, skyrocketed, as you know, Paul, in the legal market. You know, first year lawyers coming right out of law school are starting at $215,000. I mean, that's before they've even taken, spent one day in the workforce. Um, so the, the salaries are insane, in legal in particular, but they're happening across the board. I hate to say when I started at Chode Hall & Stewart, the salaries were $42,000. So that tells you a long time ago. Um, but at any rate, um, we are seeing that and people being creative with the compensation packages. What can they do? Can they offer signing bonuses? Can they offer more equity if it's in-house? 
But then above and beyond that, what are we doing in perks? Are we offering the remote, as I said, are we offering adoption services? Are we offering childcare on site? Are we offering vacations, um, option to, to work you know, remote for a, a three weeks a year, I mean, three weeks a month? You know, what are we doing in those spaces? Those are some of the things that Boston, I think, is really responding to. So I think it's interesting that you mentioned um, the, the diversity of the economy as being a selling point when you go out because a lawyers are going to want to bring their spouse, right? and their spouse might be in a totally different industry, and we don't often think of that. We think of like, well, they're the drivers of the economy, and, um, and not really that a strength. And, and I think that was shown in Pete's numbers, that there were a lot of different industries that were really pretty strong. And, and vibrant in, in the uh, region. So, I think that's one of the things with Beacon Hill, as I said, we have eight specialty divisions. And so, what we try to do, you know, for instance, if I'm working with a lawyer and they're coming here and they have a spouse or a significant other, is, you know, what area are they in? And can I refer them to my financial group? Can I refer them to our life sciences pharma group? Can I refer them to tech group? You know, where can we get them so that we can be full service stuff for folks? And also the same, obviously, for our clients. Great, thank you. So, Tucker, young professionals don't want to um, work in the office anymore. So, real estate's basically dead, right? There's no, no demand. Yeah, no demand. Kendall Not all. should no be easy demand. to get space in Kendall for these companies. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I'll speak to uh, the demand side quickly. Um, plenty of life science demand. Office demand is starting to pick up as well as uh, return to workplace efforts mount. Um, talking specifically about life sciences, a lot of that demand has been generated in two ways. Um, one, uh, organically within Boston, so companies starting here, um, getting funding, whether it's NIH, VC, um, larger biotech uh, company funding. Um, and from a supply standpoint, um, they have plenty of space to work with on the incubation side, uh, whether it's Alexandria Launch Labs, Smart Labs, et cetera, you name it. We have a great ecosystem to start a company here, not only to bring a company here, but to start one. Um, so we're seeing a lot of demand in that area, especially over the last, I'd say, five or so years, funding has picked up significantly. Um, it used to be if you were a smaller company starting in Boston, you know, with hope and a prayer, you're going to get bought out by a larger farm or a biotech company. And this is kind of the R&D area for them. Another company was their R&D unit. They'd go and buy it. With an ample amount of life science funding lately, those companies have been able to grow. And so we've seen a significant amount of life science demand in kind of that mid-range square footage. And by mid-range, I mean 30 to 50,000 square feet. It used to be just small deals or big deals. So now we're seeing that middle market start to fill out. And we also have companies coming here as well, larger companies that hasn't stopped. Uh, Ten years ago, I want to say it was six out of the 20 largest life science companies around the world were here. Now all of them are here in some sort of capacity. Um, so there's plenty of demand. Um, you'll hear talk about funding slowing a little bit with global headwinds and economic uh, inflation pressure. It's died down a little bit. It's still on pace to match 2021 levels, which are huge. Um, so we're seeing point of demand. And to your point about office space um, and lab space, life science has helped keep Boston, um, from a fundamental standpoint, um, fairly strong. Across Northeast, it's hands down the best performing market. A lot of that can be attributed to life science and those employees yeah. that a lot of them need to come into the office. A lot of it can be attributed to, towards uh, opportunistic investors, landlords, owners, developers, who are going in and developing more lab space, but also converting existing office space, whether it's vacant or not, to lab space, which has helped bring down the office vacancy rate sub substantially. Um, quick little study we did uh, this past year, all the lab conversions, um, office to lab conversions, um, Boston office. Greater Boston vacancy rate um, would be 19%, which is higher than most Northeast markets, if it wasn't for 6 million square feet of office to lab conversion over the last two years since the pandemic. So life science markets helping out, variety of other asset types. Talk about office, you can talk about retail. Um, middle of the pandemic, walked right down Kendall Square. It's a lot more lively than the financial center of Boston, the CBD, because you have employees going into the office or the lab or R&D operations. Mm -hmm. So I hope that kind of sums it up. <laughs> No, that's helpful. I think, um, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about life science uh, uh, in a while with Raquel, but um, I think you think that really softened, the life science industry kind of softened the blow for Boston. 
Definitely. Yeah. Out of out of the top ten major metros across the U.S., Boston has had um, has kept the most steady since the pandemic, and a lot of that is attributed towards um, taken away from potential vacancy or current vacancy through lab conversions, office to lab conversions. And I think we've also been seeing, or correct me if I'm wrong, but um, throughout the region, and it goes beyond, I think, greater Boston, but some, you know, the medical device sector and sort of the um, uh, biomanufacturing sectors in different parts of the state that all kind of contribute to the ecosystem, is that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we talk a lot about uh, wet lab space, we call it, in uh, commercial real estate for the industry. There's also plenty of dry lab space, whether it's robotics, 3D printing, et cetera, uh, where Boston is really becoming kind of the nucleus uh, of that across the U.S., um, especially as it relates to uh, robotics, cybersecurity, and 3D printing. Thank you, Tucker. Midori, I would, um, I, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say as to um, how you, you're out there and you're talking to companies and to um, folks about, you know, why Boston. Um, so I'd love to hear that. And I know um, there were a couple of challenges that Pete threw up on the screen with uh, income uh, inequality and stuff that uh, I, I know is uh, are things that you're working on as well. Sure. Um, thank you. So <clears throat> just following up on the earlier uh, discussion about um, sort of, you know, bringing your spouse and family to Boston, right? And sort of quality of life is something that we absolutely sell uh, to a potential business. So, Pete, you know, we saw in your presentation the location quotient uh, data. Uh, we also use that data, um, but we also uh, we go beyond fire sectors, right, the traditional sort of uh, financial sectors. We look at arts and culture sectors. We look at small businesses. We look at restaurants, right? And when we did that, we found that their location quotient is higher than that national average, meaning there's a higher concentration of arts and culture sector. Um, small businesses, restaurants uh, in Boston, right? And I don't, I don't think folks remember five or six years ago, um, there was a uh, 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 Amazon was looking for headquarter, uh, right, second quarter uh, in the U.S. market, and you know we put in our proposal, and I still have the proposal in, at my desk, uh, 200 pages long, uh, but 60% of the proposals was about that, the amenities for your families, for your kids, right? Um, uh, I think, you know, some of the stats are like walkable city, right? You can find at least, you know, park uh, that's in your walking distance, uh, the museums, right? Uh, all those amenities uh, that make business say, all right, like, let's pack up and go to Boston, right? And we're going to also bring our workforce. Uh, and we're also going to attract workforce uh, locally. So uh, that's spot on in terms of location uh, quotient on that. Uh, the second thing, you know, that was also mentioned um, in the slide uh, and a couple of times is the sort of workforce and the availability of a highly educated workforce, right? Um, I think 44% is like the, the number of people that have bachelor's degree. Um, and I think, um, it, you know, this, so that's number one reason why businesses want to uh, come here, right? Uh, so we offer services to connect them to our higher education institutions uh, for them to be able to recruit uh, and, and retain talent. But I think flip side of that, right, to your point about equity uh, agenda uh, is um, it, it, we also have employers who came to Boston um, knocking on our doors and saying, we can't find talent, right? Where, where do I go, right? And my first question to them is, well, where are you looking, right? Um, typically, four-year colleges, right? MIT, Harvard, BC, BC, Northeast, and stuff. And I said, and what I always tell them is like, well, why don't you relook at your job description? And why don't you relook at what the requirements are, true requirements are for the jobs, right? Do you really need a bachelor's degree for this? Or do you really need someone to hit the ground running? They just need some technical skills, or they just need uh, certain uh, skill sets uh, for that. And some of the big companies uh, that are here have sort of changed that behavior, right? Um, you know, I think part of it is desperation. <laughs> but second part is, you know, they, they truly were looking at it. It's like, oh, wow, like, you know, if you truly want to diversify our talent, right, if you uh, truly want to be welcoming, uh, then we should be looking at those non-traditional uh, schools like community colleges. Um, and, you know, we're able to broker, you know, relationship like science companies, right, and a lot of the technical colleges, uh, two-year colleges uh, that get uh, people um, uh, ready for work. Um, and I, I think, you know, I think uh, the other thing uh, about equity agenda uh, with the, under this administration is when, when we talk to businesses, we always ask them, um, not this way, but, you know, basically, are you going to be a good neighbor, right? Um, and I know I'm looking at Margaret uh, from Master Office Business Development because she's, like, probably rolling her eyes, like, <laughs> because I'm always like, okay, well, are you going to hire locally? Are you, you know, what are you going to be doing uh, to help our economy, our residents? 
uh, to sort of close that wealth gap, right? Um, and I'm sure you, uh, many of pe uh, people in this room know uh, the Color of Wealth Report, the Federal Reserve Bank did a few years ago, um, the, the asset of black African American in Boston is $8. Asset of white folks, uh, $240,000, right? Um, so um, we want to make sure that uh, businesses are thinking beyond uh, sort of the traditional uh, sort of business model in terms of hiring and retaining and just expanding uh, their lens a little bit and perspective uh, on that. Um, and I think uh, the last thing uh, I'll mention is um, we also oversee global affairs and tourism uh, cabinet, a department in our cabinet. Um, we have a 60 consular corps, so the consular general offices uh, representing 60 different countries. Um, and I, what we found with like businesses that's coming from abroad, right, they just want to be feel like they're at home. They just want to feel like they have people that speak the language that you know that can tell you where the supermarket is. You know that have their food and um, and you know so we have um, many uh, you know in, in Cambridge areas the UK, uh, Germany, France, uh, Japan, uh, you name it. Uh, and uh, you know our job is to kind of connect those international companies to uh, the consular core uh, businesses here. And I think broadly, you know, for economic development, uh, we're always trying to attract the, the biggest conferences, uh, and we were successful in securing the FIFA World Cup as uh, so a final 10 uh, cities. And um, that's my only non Bostonian thing. I haven't picked up sports, but soccer is the only thing I like. <laughs> so I was happy to meet them uh, and uh, recruit them for that. And then the Army-Navy game as well, right? So trying to, again, um, promote that quality of life uh, and say, hey, Boston is a fun city. Right? Um, you should come here, do your business, uh, bring families here. Uh, thank you. I, I, I like that, and I like the idea of, I don't know what initiatives there have been on, on hiring out of the tech schools and the community colleges, because I think that's a huge resource that we don't always, we always look for <clears throat> bachelor's or master's degree. And sometimes I'm astounded at what, requ <laughs> what requires a master's degree. So I think um, that's good. Um, we're going to um, dial in uh, to some of the industries now. Um, and we'd like to get um, what you see as competitive advantages, um, how we're addressing challenges, things like that. Sabrina, I'd, I'd like to start with you and to hear um, your thoughts on, on what uh, what our strengths are, what our challenges, how we're addressing them and moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start from big picture and kind of bring it down to a very hyper local level, if that's okay. Um, when I spoke about J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the things about the company is that there's, a, there's an arm called market expansion. And market expansion really focuses on the growth and depth of the company. And part of this piece is also increasing the retail presence of Chase Bank. And so when we think about the retail presence of Chase Bank from a greater Boston market, over the next five years, we're going to, be, we're going to have fi about 50 branches opened. Um, we launched the first retail branch in 2019, December of 2019 in Dedham. And then in 2020, January 2020, is the mm -hmm. flagship, um, which is downtown Boston. And the company continued to expand regardless of the pandemic. Um, a piece of that is also rolling out what we're calling community. Um, it's, it's really called community branches. And I actually work for the community branch. And there's going to be 17 community center branches across the country. One of them happened to be right here in Mattapan um, within the city. And the idea and the purpose of that particular space is to really address the racial wealth gap. And so we know um, Boston and just Massachusetts being number six, so thank you for sharing that, that piece. J.P. Morgan Chase knows that, where those pockets and areas are. And so being specific in placing a community center branch right in the heart of the city in a, in a neighborhood that's often overlooked, right? When we think about the neighborhoods throughout 
Boston, sometimes we're talking about the Dorchester, the Roxbury, um, and then the Mattapan, right? And so to put it in the Mattapan area is super significant for that area, um, for that particular reason. So what that does across the country is that it, it increases economic mobility, right? It's bringing jobs to these local communities, um, but it's also creating access. And I think that's the important piece is, especially when we're thinking about financial health. And I'm very specific when we're talking about financial health, because when we think about financial literacy, that's information that you get to know. But when you start talking about financial health, you're talking about your, your habits. You're talking about the application of the in, putting that information into play. And so from a community, community center standpoint, having these centers inside of a branch, you're connecting the dots. Right? People are coming into the hub to learn more about the products and services that's offered to them, whether that's home lending or small businesses. But they also have the opportunity to feel comfortable to come to learn about how to open up an account. Right? For, for a lot of areas um, that's underserved in what we call low to moderate income communities, it's very hard to walk into the bank where you don't even know where to start. And so when you think about having a center kind of located in close proximity to where you live, you're building that access so that people have the ability to come in to learn about what it takes to even bank and then to also learn about other opportunities that are offered in that financial health arena, how to buy a home, how to start a business, where do I go to actually figure out how to, how to um, create that business um, so I can launch and be able to get real estate and be a part of the full ecosystem. And so when we think about those pieces, you're also getting, you're also tapping into some of the other things that Midori, that you mentioned here, right? The arts, the culture, the restaurants, um, and servicing those opportunity. When the report came out um, about the $8 for a black family and the 240000 that is specifically important from a financial standpoint to address. Um, and so when you get to the root of it and you really start to implement programming um, around what that looks like and to help elevate folks, then we're creating spaces for um, equity. And so that, that is one of the biggest pieces. I think it's around access um, to fi financial health, but also um, opportunity for folks to work. Uh, specifically, when you think about these branches in these neighborhoods as well, it's also hiring, right? Hiring um, and reflecting what that community looks like. And so in Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts happens to be the third largest Haitian community, which is where the largest Haitian community resides. Um, number one is uh, Florida, and then the second is New York, and then it happens to be Boston. 44% of um, the Haitian community lives in Mattapan. Right? And so when you think about the community center branch um, happening and, and being where it's located, half of the folks that are hired also speak Haitian Creole. Right? That in of itself creates an opportunity where folks feel comfortable to not, to not only come in to talk about something that's very daunting, which is finances, but to be able to speak their own language, to understand the information that they're receiving. Um, and so when you think about that hiring pieces and those opportunities, there's so many things that happen. And so part of my role is not only to connect people to those financial resources, but community organizing. And so when you start to talk it, um, with organizations, and some of the ones that I, I don't mind I'm mentioning here in this space, is organizations like BECMA, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, right? That, that was actually designed and developed after the report. And working in collaboration with organizations like that connects people to additional resources. And so part of that community organizing is if J.P. Morgan Chase cannot address all of the situations, then we have to at least be able to um, help folks get connected to resources. Um, and, I think that's, and I think that's very critical when we think about the ecosystem and how things kind of work and how do we connect folks to resources. How long has the center been open? So, great question. <laughs> it is coming up on a year on July 27th. And so I'm, I'm preparing for the year celebration, um, all of the organizations that we've helped to touch and bring um, financial health resources with. And I think what's so important about this, um, because you know we've known that J.P. Morgan Chase has been in the greater Boston area for many years, but the retail space has not. We've only been around for three and a half years um, as of as of now. What's so special about that is that you get to also activate the bigger, the, the full force of the firm, right? All of these departments that are typically um, assessing the greater the greater um, community is now coming down to a hyper local and bringing forth information um, to a very local 
perspective. So one year is coming up. We're super excited about that. Um, yeah. And how's the report card? How's it been? It's been good. It's good. been it's been it's been really good. Um, you know, some of the small businesses. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak of some, right? One of the things that's so unique and, and special about Boston is our restaurants, right? And the different type of foods and the flavors and the culture. Um, because we have space, um, folks are so interested in, okay, now that I can bank with you, what else can I, can I do with you? Well, hey, we can also serve your employees, right? And help your employees understand even their finances. That's a different concept um, for banking. It's a very different concept. And so it's really coming down to that level. And then also thinking about the community organizing piece. How, who gets to use that space? The community. And so if there's community organizations that may not have real estate brick and mortar, they're able to actually work with us to say, hey, I would like to host a community meeting. Of course, right? This is a space in the neighborhood for the neighborhood for you. And so we collaborate with organizations in that way as okay. well. And I might, uh, we've heard twice now about uh, the importance of sort of our cultural institutions as part of um, making it a successful environment. And I'll just do an editorial comment that we need to pitch in and do whatever we can to make them strong, given that they've been whacked pretty hard by the pandemic as well. Um, Don, I'm going to uh, throw it over to you for maybe a different perspective on uh, Chase, at least this component of Chase, is a fairly recent uh, player in the in the market, and uh, and as you mentioned, Liberty has been around for a long time. Maybe you can give a, a sense of perspective on on Boston and Greater Boston as a place to do business. Well, sure. Well, as I said, you know, we were we were born here, and um, you know, we've always drawn strength from from our location here in Boston. But if you'd forgive a government affairs guy from giving sort of a government affairs perspective. You know, there's a perception out there that to get a, a business friendly uh, environment or political environment, you know, you have to go to a deep red southern state. And, you know, that that's not true in my, uh, in my estimation. Um, I've been in government affairs for a long time and I found uh, Massachusetts and Boston uh, to be, you know, you need to work it, right? You, you gotta put the effort in. You need to um, put the effort in and work work with folks, but it, it is, they are willing to work with you. The legislature is willing to work with you. Those, the city of Boston, you know, Midori mentioned the number of mayors she's worked with. When I first got into this game, Ray Flynn was mayor. We've had good working relationships with the city of Boston for the entirety of our time. Now, sometimes that goes up and it goes down on episodic, but, but for the most part, it's been a, a great working relationship. When we built a new office tower about 10 years ago, we needed some help from the city of Boston and the mayor, uh, the Menino administration. And, you know, it, it took a little work, but we, we got it. And the property and casualty insurance industry is one of the most heavily, reg I mean, everybody's regulated, right? But PNC insurance is one of the most heavily regulated industries that I'm aware of. Everything we do is regulated. And it's largely regulated at the state level. That's why every state has a state insurance department. We've also had a great working relationship over the years, again, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but for the most part, good working relationships with the Massachusetts Insurance Department. The legislature, um, you know, we've talked about some of the problems that we've got. Um, you know, it, some of them are very hard to, to, to correct, but they're always talking about it at the legislature, and we always have a voice at the table, but you've got to work it. And just speaking specifically about Boston, so, for instance, Liberty belongs to the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. We belong to a better city. We belong to the Boston Municipal Research Bureau, which I'm current chair. Um, these are entities that give you access and a voice, and they will work for you. So, again, this idea that, that you know, a progressive blue state may be great because of the cultural assets and diversity, and that is all true. But the idea that you can't do business in those states, I don't think is true. But, again, you, you need to work it. Uh, make the effort, and this is a, a, a great state to, to, to do business in. And, you know, 110 years speaks for itself. We could have left many times, I suppose. We never, to my knowledge, we never ever really thought about it. Um, and then I'll make a pitch about, uh, you know, innovation. Um, I'm the only guy up here with a tie, practically, right? It, it reflects the fact that the property and casualty insurance industry is still a little buttoned down, a little stayed. But believe me, innovation is everywhere. We, uh, in 2019, we announced a five-year, $25 million collaboration with MIT to work on artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is going to transform everything, including 
insurance. Uh, so you don't get, you know, you have to be in Boston to avail yourself of that. I mean, you can work with MIT if you're not in Boston, but it helps, you know, it's part of the culture. And then in terms of um, being able to access, you know, talent of all backgrounds, right? We have seven ERGs at Liberty Mutual, and they're helping us bring in more people of diverse backgrounds. Um, there again, you know, you, you've got to make the effort, and you've got to start, uh, and this is a wonderful place. We are also part of the Massachusetts Apprentice Network uh, to find those um, other, you know, rather non-traditional avenues of drawing talent. Um, so this, you know, I'm a Bostonian. I mean, I grew up in the, in the greater Boston area. I've lived inside 128 or in Boston for the last 35 years. I, um, I love Boston. It's a wonderful place, and I'll, I'll promote it to anyone, anywhere. Um, but, you know, some of the perceptions of, of being a, not the most business-friendly um, environment overstated, in my opinion. And, again, but you've got to put in the effort and work with groups like Mass Econ. I mean, they're doing great work, and we're glad to, to help. And uh, I think everybody needs to do that. It doesn't just happen, though. You've got to, you've got to work it and make it happen. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it, that's an interesting perspective on the, the legislative process as um, – I think I, I probably agree with you. It's it's usually messy and not really pretty. But um, well, you know, it's a it's a it, contact sport. You know, we love our sports here in Boston, and it is a contact sport. But again, you know, we have a tradition here. I mean, it, this is a blue state, right? It, it's been from all of my life and will be for the rest of my life. But we elect moderate Republican governors periodically, right? Mm -hmm. And they work well with the legislature, the Democratic legislature. I mean, Charlie Baker and um, Marty Walsh before Mayor Wu, they, they touted the fact that they worked well together. And I'm sure that's going to continue with Mayor Wu and whoever the next uh, governor is. It's not likely to be a Republican, in my opinion, this time. But, you know, we've worked well with re Democratic governors. Deval Patrick was terrific. We, we accomplished what we called managed competition in auto insurance, something that no one thought would happen. We were such an outlier in auto insurance, which is important to us. It's our biggest line of insurance. Deval Patrick's commissioner of insurance made it happen, and it's been a great success now for about 10 years. So you can get things done, uh, and we do have challenges, but we're working at them, and, and I think we can find solutions. Thank you, Don. That's very helpful. R Raquel, if you could um, talk to us about um, Santa Fe's growth. I know Santa Fe's been here for, for a number of years and um, uh, has facilities both here in Cambridge and uh, in Metro West and um, is a big player in, in the community. Maybe you could talk to that. Sure, sure. I think there are um, a couple of aspects related to talent and footprint as well as the ecosystem and then talking about being a good neighbor, the community engagement, which is so important, um, not only uh, for us, but also for prospective talent. It's the type of questions that we are getting. So uh, Sanofi has been on a transformation for the past three or four years to really reshape our pipeline. Uh, we are highly focused on um, specialty care now. So our focus in terms of research is really in the areas of immunology, oncology, rare diseases, and neuro. And uh, our global headquarters for, special uh, for specialty care is actually here in the area. So of course, we have our global headquarters in Paris, but for specialty care, which is, uh, of course, a, a key area of strategic focus for us, we have decided that um, the global headquarters for that is here um, in, in Cambridge. Uh, so, so we do have, as I said, we have about 2,500 uh, colleagues that have been brought together in Cambridge Crossing, which is truly uh, the largest um, site that we have uh, in the United States, probably one of, of the largest globally, where we bring together uh, not only our research colleagues, but areas like medical affairs, commercial, all in one uh, campus, if you will. And uh, I think what is important for us when we think about our workforce uh, and the nature of the colleagues that are coming together for those purposes purposeful interactions on site, um, we have a lot of colleagues that are actually uh, in the lab, so talking about wet, wet lab, right? Uh, they cannot work remotely. They must come to the site to be able to perform their, uh, their job. 
And uh, Cambridge, the area, has really been uh, the place that we found was the most cohesive of bringing all of them together, simplify our operations, uh, and move forward with what we call uh, is the future of scientific work, lab of the future. So as part of, of what we have uh, implemented, and we are in the process of the move-in for our laboratory colleagues, uh, we, we have uh, taken this opportunity to really drive forward many of the aspects of how we will continue to uh, simplify but really create the future of how we conduct research and our uh, research and development operations. So we have uh, taken this as an opportunity to look at our internal service model for our uh, laboratory colleagues, how uh, we manage certain aspects of our research processes, for example, biosample management, uh, among many other things. Um, talking a little bit about hybrid, uh, it is important not only for our uh, colleagues um, that are office-based, if you will, if you can even say office-based nowadays, right? Uh, but it is equally important uh, for our colleagues that are um, in research and in the laboratories as well. And part of what we want to make sure we are ensuring it is, again, that we give this um, human experience uh, and that we take that to the next level in terms of when can they come to the laboratories? How do we give them uh, the opportunities and, and, and make this process of coming onto site but also work remotely uh, seamlessly so that they can connect themselves, uh, not within groups only, but uh, across different parts uh, of the organization. Um, across Massachusetts, we have also uh, not only this um, important site here in the area, but we have sites uh, in Framingham where we have our industrial affairs uh, colleagues, uh, as well as our CMC group, our chemistry manufacturing controls. It continues to be a center of excellence for us, as well as the work that uh, we have been doing in Waltham, where we have our genomic medicines unit. We continue to invest, and we are investing in our mRNA center, uh, where recently we also have acquired T-Bio. Uh, so I think from a footprint perspective, uh, this reiterate our commitment uh, and, and the reason why, again, we have decided to invest uh, heavily in the area. Uh, the ecosystem here is clearly very rich. Um, we have not only a host of leading academic institutions, but teaching hospitals, independent hospitals. And we have access uh, also to this very rich ecosystem when it comes to partnership with startups and, and other biotech companies. So you talked a little bit about biolabs, um, Lab Central. So recently we had an opportunity to host, for example, a competition that is a global competition where uh, we, we provide opportunities for startups to come in and work with us uh, in, in, in a certain facility for Biolab Lab Central. So they come in into the facility and then we have our own teams, uh, our scientists come in and partner with them, help coach them as, as they work on particular projects to, again, advance science uh, and, and bring transformative drugs um, to patients. And all of that, again, it's possible here because of the diversity and the richness uh, of the ecosystem. From a talent perspective, um, I, I think it's important to say that um, when it comes to talent access, of course, it's competitive not only here, everywhere, uh, but I do believe that uh, companies are looking at uh, different ways and creative ways in which we can also access um, early talent. So, for instance, um, in our case, we have developed partnerships with Mass Bay. Uh, to provide internships so that we can continue to create a pipeline of talent, not only for us, but for the industry in general. And um, we are hopeful that we'll be able to announce very soon uh, a fellowship program that we have with a historically black college and university, very reputable in the United States, where we will bring, uh, we will bring uh, talent that is coming from other states to be uh, doing the fellowship here uh, in Cambridge as well. Uh, again, so all of that um, represents the, the how attractive the, the environment here in Cambridge is where we can bring talent from other states but also international. We have brought in global colleagues that are eager to, to come here and work uh, from, from Cambridge and from Massachusetts because of this richness. Um, and, and then lastly, I, I did want to talk about the community part. Uh, I, I think one of the things that um, is transforming the way we do things um, is this idea of the purposeful experience and, and what is our proposition to talent, but not only to talent, to the overall community. What, what is our contract with society, right? Uh, companies uh, have been very clear and we have been very clear on what is our uh, commitment and contract with society. And as part of that, uh, we have engaged over the past year with over 80 organizations 
locally where we have provided uh, significant contributions. Uh, but, but two examples in particular. Um, I, I think one is just to start where we are uh, helping create careers in biomedical um, life sciences so that we can again continue to fuel this pipeline of, of talent. And then Mass Life Center, uh, Center I know, is one of George's favorite, uh, where um, we have the Next Gen uh, initiative where we have been a founding member, where we are focusing on actually gender parity uh, when it comes to creating opportunities, again, for females uh, through venture capital. Uh, so uh, from a life science perspective, I could go on and I could speak probably for another 30 minutes, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, the highlights of what we have been doing um, inside the company and why we consider the area to be, of course, a very important hub for us. Well, thank you. It sounds like the, the life science cluster, the energy of, of the life science community that we have here has been a big driver <clears throat> for your focus on Greater Boston, and then you've reacted creatively to find ways to, um, you know, access talent to build within the community. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Good. I'm Kyle. Last but not least, <laughs> chomping at the bit. We'd love to hear from you on um, the defense, high technology. Um, what the uh, what the region has for um, capabilities that are helping you and your company thrive? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Tucker actually mentioned uh, cybersecurity and robotics, and, and actually, biggest driver for us here is innovation. And uh, the two main areas we have in this air, in this Boston region. Uh, in Dedham, we actually do uh, high reliability NSA certified uh, cybersecurity products. We manufacture, design them there. Um, so a large team uh, there, and then my team specifically uh, is is in robotics solidly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we make uh, unmanned underwater vehicles, uh, mostly sold into the U.S. Navy and other navies around the world, uh, maintaining freedom of navigation, uh, subsea, uh, in high contested environments. Um, so it's, it's very high tech. Uh, we're actually, innovation is, is part of that, obviously, but we, we were spun out of MIT, and so we were actually a startup um, acquired by General Dynamics in 2016. Uh, Bluefin Robotics was the name. Um, so we, we got absorbed into the company. Um, we, we brought forward a, a way to solve uh, a problem that our country had um, to take a warfighter out of the environment, uh, our, our sailors, keeping them safe, uh, and putting a machine in there. It's a lot less risky. Um, but making that do a job of a person, uh, you know, autonomy is big in, this, in, in the industry now. Um, you hear a lot about surface uh, autonomy of cars, uh, and there's a new startup every day of, of, of autos being autonomous. Um, it's a different problem underwater. You know, you don't have any of the uh, same resources you do uh, uh, on land, GPS being one of them, but um, you think of those problems and how to solve them, and we have a really uh, high-tech workforce uh, funnel uh, in our university systems. Uh, you know, MIT is an example, but we have a lot of other places that we team up with. Uh, invest in uh, studies, invest in projects uh, in universities around the area, uh, and then we actually benefit from that research, and we can transition that research from uh, research paper, research projects, into something that can actually help uh, and can actually be produced and put out in the field. Um, so that's a, that's a huge, huge funnel for us. Um, it's also a, a, a big uh, attractor of, of employees to, to my area because we can see things applied. Um, it is high tech. It's not, you know, the stodgy old defense business. Um, so we, we, can, we can actually... Uh, retain, attract the funnel of employees, bring them in. Um, so that's, that's a really big, big thing for us. Uh, and, and actually in our area here in Boston, uh, we do measure attrition rate as I'm, I'm sure all companies do, but, but our rate is actually the lowest uh, in, in our group across the country. And I think it's, it's due to that funnel, that high tech uh, innovation uh, workforce, as well as the environment, as we were all talking about here. Uh, the resources we have in the area, uh, the family, resources, things to do, restaurants, everything. I think it brings things together. Obviously, it's a very competitive market in a high-tech industry, but uh, we, we, see, we see good uh, you know, all-around environmental impacts that, that people really seem to resonate with, too. So. Thanks. And I, I mean, we, 
I know we have a thriving high tech industry, and do you find that um, you have sort of this cluster mentality where you can draw talent from other regions because they know they're coming here? Yeah, a, a bit. Um, we actually have a, a pretty robust region here, just in, in New England area, um, across states, not just Massachusetts. But uh, there's a there's a large marine industry, personally for me, which which applies. Uh, yeah. You know, Rhode Island, New Hampshire. We have all those those funnels into this Boston area, uh, where we can apply. Like I mentioned, research and, and technology. We have a lot of water. We have a lot of water. Uh, I mean, that's that's super helpful because we can do all our tests in Boston Harbor. And yeah. Don't ask me what's out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all. What a wonderfully diverse discussion of um, sort of the strengths and challenges and directions of uh, our beloved uh, region. So thank you very much. Are there... Um, Questions? We'd love to have some questions. Uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, there are lots of benefits to Boston. Uh, the talent, the workforce, the colleges, all of those things. One of the uh, things that is going to challenge that growth in the future is housing. Do you see that there are things that the, the city could potentially do, the region could be doing? Um, is housing going to be an issue for Boston? Maybe start with Midori and, I don't know, maybe Tucker, real estate. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. The housing is perhaps one of the reasons why businesses are hesitant to come here, right? Because uh, their workforce aren't able to uh, live uh, and enjoy the amenities uh, that we're talking about. So a couple of things uh, Mayor will uh, put in a proposal to City Council recently uh, for $200 million uh, in opera dollars uh, to create more affordable housing that's focused more on ownership, right, uh, and building assets uh, because we want people to have the security of staying in Boston long-term with uh, them and their families. I still need approval, uh, but that's the type of investment we're making. Uh, second thing is um, the Lincoln study. Um, so at Boston, we have this legislation that any commercial development over 100,000 square feet it triggers linkage uh, for these uh, companies to pay into housing trust and jobs trust, right? Um, and we have a healthy development. <laughs> we've had a healthy development. So um, uh, one thing that we've done is to uh, work with Carl Seidman, the economist at MIT, to relook at the formula for the linkage study to see what is the projected uh, need for affordable housing in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And do we need to adjust uh, our formula for our uh, linkage trigger on that? So those are two sort of specific things that uh, we're doing. But uh, absolutely, the housing housing is, is definitely a need in Boston. Yeah, housing is definitely a need. Um, I think it's less so um, when you get to the luxury housing. There's plenty of that going up. So companies come in here, your C-suite, managerial level, not an issue. Um, it's incentivizing developers uh, to build appropriate housing for the rest of the workforce. Um, we talk about the recent land study by the BDPA and Wu administration. Um, right there, there's plenty of plots where we can build, especially that, that are transit-oriented. Speaking to the, um, the light rail and the heavy rail, you can get around Boston pretty easily. Um, it's about putting that product in areas uh, we can grow a community and then get back to where the employers are as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm Kyle, last but not least. <laughs> Chomping at the bit. We'd love to hear from you on um, the defense, high technology, um, what the uh, what the region has for um, capabilities that are helping you and your company thrive. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Tucker actually mentioned uh, cybersecurity and robotics, and, and actually biggest driver for us here is innovation. And uh, the two main areas we have in this air, in this Boston region. Uh, in Dedham, we actually do uh, high reliability NSA certified uh, cybersecurity products. We manufacture, design them there. Um, so a large team uh, there, and then my team specifically uh, is is in robotics solidly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we make uh, unmanned underwater vehicles, uh, mostly sold into the U.S. Navy and other navies around the world. Uh, maintaining freedom of navigation, uh, subsea, uh, in high contested environments. Um, so it's, it's very high tech. Uh, we're actually, 
Innovation is, is part of that, obviously, but we, we were spun out of MIT, and so we were actually a startup um, acquired by General Dynamics in 2016. Uh, Bluefin Robotics was the name. Um, so we, we got absorbed into the company. Um, we, we brought forward a, a way to solve uh, a problem that our country had um, to take a warfighter out of the environment, uh, our, our sailors, keeping them safe, uh, and putting a machine in there. It's a lot less risky. Um, but making that do a job of a person, uh, you know, autonomy is big in this in, in the industry now. Um, you hear a lot about surface uh, autonomy of cars, uh, and there's a new startup every day of of, of autos being autonomous. Um, it's a different problem underwater. You know, you don't have any of the uh, same resources you do. Uh, uh, on land, GPS being one of them, but um, you think of those problems and how to solve them, and we have a really uh, high-tech workforce uh, funnel uh, in our university systems. Uh, you know, MIT is an example, but we have a lot of other places that we team up with. Uh, invest in uh, studies, invest in projects uh, in universities around the area, uh, and then we actually benefit from that research, and we can transition that research from uh, research paper, research projects, into something that can actually help uh, and can actually be produced and put out in the field. Um, so that's a, that's a huge, huge funnel for us. Um, it's also a, a, a big uh, attractor of, of employees to, to my area because we can see things applied. Um, it is high tech. It's not you know the stodgy old defense business. Um, so we, we, can, we can actually... Uh, uh, retain, attract the funnel of employees, bring them in. Um, so that's, that's a really big, big thing for us. Uh, and, and actually in our area here in Boston, uh, we do measure attrition rate as I'm, I'm sure all companies do, but, but our rate is actually the lowest uh, in, in our group across the country. And I think it's, it's due to that funnel, that high tech uh, innovation uh, workforce, as well as the environment, as we were all talking about here. Uh, the resources we have in the area, uh, the family, resources, things to do, restaurants, everything. I think it brings things together. Obviously, it's a very competitive market in a high-tech industry, but uh, we, we, see, we see good uh, you know, all-around environmental impacts that, that people really seem to resonate with, too. So. Thanks. And I, I mean, we, I know we have a thriving high-tech industry, and do you find that um, you have sort of this cluster mentality where you can draw talent from other regions because they know they're coming here? Yeah, a, a bit. Um, we actually have a, a pretty robust region here, just in, in New England area, um, across states, not just Massachusetts, but uh, there's, a, there's a large marine industry, personally for me, which, which applies, uh, yeah. you know, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, we have all those, those funnels into this Boston area uh, where we can apply, like I mentioned, research and, and technology. We have a lot of water. We have a lot of water. Uh, I mean, that's, that's super helpful because we can do all our tests in Boston Harbor. And yeah. Don't ask me what's out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you all. What a wonderfully diverse discussion of um, sort of the strengths and challenges and directions of uh, our beloved uh, region. So thank you very much. Are there... Um, Questions. We'd love to have some questions. Uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, there are lots of benefits to Boston. Uh, the talent, the workforce, the colleges, all of those things. One of the uh, things that is going to challenge that growth in the future is housing. Do you see that there are things that the, the city could potentially do, the region could be doing? Um, is housing going to be an issue for Boston? Maybe start with Midori and, I don't know, maybe Tucker, real estate. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. The housing is perhaps one of the reasons why businesses are hesitant to come here, right? Because uh, their workforce aren't able to uh, live uh, and enjoy the amenities uh, that we're talking about. So a couple of things uh, Mayor will uh, put in a proposal to City Council recently uh, for $200 million uh, in ARPA dollars uh, to create more affordable housing that's focused more on ownership, right, uh, and building assets uh, because we want people to have the security of staying in Boston long term with uh, them and their families. Uh, still needs approval, uh, but uh, that's the type of investment we're making. 
Uh, second thing is um, the Lincoln study. Um, so uh, Boston, we have this legislation that any commercial development over 100,000 square feet, it triggers linkage uh, for these uh, companies to pay into housing trust and jobs trust, right? Um, and we have a healthy development. <laughs> we've had a healthy development. So um, uh, one thing that we've done is to uh, work with Carl Seidman, economist at MIT, to relook at the formula for the linkage study to see what is the projected uh, need for affordable housing in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And do we need to adjust uh, our formula for our uh, linkage trigger on that? So those are two sort of specific things that uh, we're doing. But uh, absolutely, the housing housing is, is definitely a need in Boston. Yeah, housing is definitely a need. Um, I think it's less so um, when you get to the luxury housing. There's plenty of that going up. So companies come in here, your C-suite managerial level, not an issue. Um, it's incentivizing developers uh, to build appropriate housing for the rest of the workforce. Um, we talk about the recent land study by the BDPA and Wu administration. Um, right there, there's plenty of plots where we can build, especially that, that are transit-oriented. Speaking to the, um, the light rail and the heavy rail, you can get around Boston pretty easily. Um, it's about putting that product in areas uh, where we can grow a community and then get back to where the employers are as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I and other, other things. Um, I think we have a posture nationally that might be an advantage to location decisions or growth decisions. Can you guys probably understand where I'm coming from? So can you talk about that? Is, is that ethos out there as a Massachusetts differentiator when it comes to location decisions or moving our family here, uh, some of the support we have in terms of our resources and our sort of political Anybody want to touch that one? Sabrina? You want to try that? No? Lori? I mean, I would, cert I would certainly say that um, I think Boston is in the forefront in a lot of um, some of those more controversial, meaning that they're, they've taken a step ahead in some cases. Um, and I think that does draw people to Boston. I think the ability to perhaps work together again is, is something, I mean, I can't speak specifically to government stuff necessarily, but um, I will say that I think from the very beginning, when I started in Boston, some of the things that were viewed as negative in Boston are definitely no longer there. And I think part of that stems from um, the inclusion of the gay and lesbian rights that went through, gay marriage, all of those kinds of things, straight through to what's happening, you know, perhaps today in the, in the state house. So I think we're seeing some of that, and I hope that that will continue to draw a diverse population to Boston. So yes, I think it does help us, would be my insight to that. Yeah, I'll take a hack at the uh, porcupine question, but... Um... <laughs> uh, just work, Avis and Young, working with the multi-market uh, requirements for companies looking to set up a headquarters, a satellite office, and, you know, we get down to a short list of states before we start looking at actual space. Um, those conversations are starting to come up. And not as much as probably it would prior to the pandemic when there wasn't, a, you know, now employees can stay where they are. And they have, you know, it's a little bit different uh, if you're a company where all our employees are going to be. Now you have remote employees who can call in from wherever and choose their state. Um, but it is something that's starting to come up along with ESG. Um, and I think Fed wiping their hands with a recent, uh, recent uh, issue um, leads it up to the state and the company level to help make those decisions and be incentivized uh, by their employee base. Thanks. Other questions? I think I saw some hands earlier. Well. Thanks, and thank you all. Good. And thank you, panel.
Uh, well, thank you all um, for, and you know, thank you, uh, panelists. That was a great discussion. And as I said, as we started the conversation today uh, with this panel, is you know, takeaways. There, there's a lot to take away from this conversation because it's not in our world. It's not just you know incentives or you know costs or it, there's another element and 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 that was certainly discussed here today and it's it's valuable for us we're right in the midst uh, as an organization of uh developing you know, these short uh videos about the different regions and about our different industries and you know little 30 30 second and 60 minute, uh, second uh clips that will be you know be out there in social media and and you know, one that we didn't do uh, yet, and it's not uh, far along in development, is our Greater Boston video. And and this conversation will directly impact what what we actually produce. And so, we at Mass Econ we're very thankful, thank uh, thankful to all, for all of you, uh, all your time this morning, all your perspectives to Paul as moderator for every uh, all our audience. We're we're all here in three D. Uh, it's a wonderful thing uh, that uh, we are getting together more as an, uh, as uh, uh, as uh, uh, public spirited uh, citizens and and able to meet as an uh, organization like this. So you know we have it's great that we have a little time to network. And so let's get to right uh, let's get to that. I want to thank again our sponsors so much uh, for supporting this event. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at, at future Mass Econ events as well. And please take use, uh, make use of our 15 minutes here to, to network and get to know each other a little bit better. So thank you all very much. Everybody have a great day. Sure, so from a, from a real estate standpoint, the uh, lab market or life science market is the largest um, in North America. Uh, we have enough supply to service any company growing in Boston or coming to Boston, whether that's a large uh, company that needs an ample amount of square footage or a company that's smaller, whether they're coming to Boston or growing through incubation space. We have, it's not just Cambridge anymore. We will find lab space. You'll find lab space throughout greater Boston. We also find uh, complementary uh, real estate services or real estate assets such as biomanufacturing space. Um, GMP, CGMP space that's expanding in Boston as well. So in terms of uh, a market um, that you're looking at, whether you're already here in Boston or coming from out of state, uh, it's a one-stop shopping. Uh, you have everything from labor to the life science uh, product on the real estate side to a great ecosystem uh, on the private and public side to work with and grow your business. I think one of the biggest reasons why people come to Boston is its diversity of industries. I think we see so many available industries here from tech and financial services, life sciences, consulting, healthcare. There's just any industry is here in Boston. And you see that whether there's a partnership of looking people looking to relocate or it just an individual coming to Boston. And then certainly just Boston in and of itself offers so much in its extracurricular, whether it's arts, you know, dining, uh, sports, <laughs> all those good things that Boston offers, I think those are some of the things that really drive people to the Boston area.